Hi, home. Um, I'm really pleased that there have been a lot of questions about it. Um, people are trying to work it. And what I want to do is um, show you how you confront a problem like this um, using Mendel's rules and solve it. Okay, but to do that, I need to use the overhead. So um, I'm going to kill this for a second. Kick on the overhead and see if we can work this problem. Don't trip. I just say that because I would. Um, I actually had people taking bets to see how long it would take before I tripped over one of these cords. Um, okay, so solving die hybrid cross problems is not terribly difficult if you keep in mind Mendel's basic rules. Okay, Mendel's rule of independent assortment is particularly critical here because Mendel's rule of independent assortment says that um, traits, alleles for different traits, do not influence each other. It's as if each one is in a little vacuum all by itself and you don't have to worry about the other set of alleles when you solve the first set. So with this problem, we crossed around yellow with a wrinkled green. We got these ratios out, equal frequencies of all four possible progeny types. So what were the parent genotypes? Um, with a little bit of deductive reasoning, you can actually solve this without having to go through all of the ratios. But I want to show you the ratios so that if you, do, if you don't immediately see how to solve it, you can. All right, so Mendel's rule says that what's happening with the round versus wrinkled is independent of what's happening with the yellow and the green. So we can um, ignore the yellow and greens and just look at round and wrinkled. Okay, so um, independent assortment says that we can look at round versus wrinkled, then look at yellow versus green. All right, now the second thing that you must look at when you're solving these kinds of genetic problems is ratios. The ratios will oftentimes give you the answer right off the bat. Okay, so look at the ratio of round versus wrinkled. We have a one to one ratio. Half a round, half a wrinkle. Okay, so for round versus wrinkled, we have a one to one ratio. All right, and that happens. Um, if this individual is heterozygous for the, the round um, seed shape. Right? We know that this one's homozygous, so we can say that this one's little r, little r. We know that because it's showing the recessive trait. Okay? And we know that wrinkled is segregating out in this next generation. Right? If this individual was homozygous dominant, we'd never see wrinkled progeny. So this one must be big R, little r. Well, let's just see if that works. A big R, little r produces two types of gametes, big R and little r gametes. Okay. The little r individual only produces one type of gamete, little r, little r gametes. So we can just do one of these little Punnett squares, look at the possible combinations, and see that we get one half big R, little r, one half, little r, little r. Does everybody see how that works? Good, okay. So that means that gives us our one to one ratio. All right, so we've solved the problem with regards to the round versus wrinkled trait. We can do the same thing to try and solve for the yellow versus green. Okay, so for yellow versus green, um, again, ignore what's happening with the round. Just look at the yellow and the green, and we see that we have a one-to-one -one ratio of yellow to green. Okay, one-to-one -one ratio of yellow to green. Again, that's happening because we know that our wrinkled, our green individual up here 
that's the recessive trait, so it must be carrying both of the recessive alleles. The individual up here must be heterozygous because we're seeing segregation of the recessive trait and we get a one-to-one -one ratio. So again, you can just do a Punnett square to see if that works. This individual produces big Y, little y gametes. The little y, little y individual can only produce one type of gamete. So the result is a one-to-one -one ratio of big Y, little y, to little y, little y. All right. So what have I done? I've basically broken this problem down from a more complicated problem into a very simple problem where I only have to deal with one pair of alleles at a time. Mendel's rule of independent assortment says we can do that. Right? So if you're confronted with higher levels of crosses, and we'll actually look at some of those today, where you have three traits segregating, or four, or five, or ten, doesn't matter. At this, at this stage, Mendel's rule says we can break it down so that it's nothing but a bunch of little single gene crosses. And that makes it a lot easier to solve. All right, so the answer then, what are the genotypes of the parents? The round yellow was big R, little r, big Y, little y. The wrinkled green was little r, little r, little y, little y. And that's how you solve that problem. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. <clears throat> hmm? It does. It sort of describes how that's working. But we'll go over a bunch of other examples as well. The question was, does the book, um, does the book describe that sort of method? It sort of does. Um, but we'll go through a lot more problems so I can sort of illustrate how the, the thought process works. When you're looking at classical genetics problems, ratios are so important that that's the first thing you should be looking at. What are the ratio of offspring I get? Do I get a one to one ratio? Do I get a three to one ratio? Do I get, do I get a one to two to one ratio? All of those ratios are critically important in figuring out what's happening with the cross, as you'll see. Okay, so um, at the end of the period, there we go. at the end of the period last time, I'm going to have to wait a bit for this to warm up and, and start displaying. At the end of the period last time, um, I was looking at two rules of probability that will help you in figuring out the frequencies of offspring that result from various crosses. Okay. That first rule is the product rule, okay? the multiplication rule, or the and rule. And as I would said, if you have two or more events occurring at the same time, then the probability of that joint event is the, the product of the individual probabilities. Um, and I gave you a simple example of that. If we Flip a coin three times, what's the probability that all three flips will be heads? Um, the probability of an individual flip being a head is one half if it's a true coin. And of course, for the, the, um, the really brainy people out there, we're ignoring the small probability that it lands on edge. Okay. So either heads or tails. Probability of a head is one half. So if you flip three times and you want heads on all three flips, it's as if those events occurring are occurring, in a sense, simultaneously, one right after the other. So the probability that all three flips are heads is this, one half for the probability of a flip being a head times the next flip being a head times the next flip being a head. This is one eighth. Okay? So you multiply those probabilities together. The other rule I gave you was the sum rule. 
If you have alternate events that can occur, you flip a coin, it comes out either heads or tails. Okay? They can't happen at the same time. You can't have a flip that's both heads and tails. Okay? If, if that's the case, then you add the probabilities together. So another example I gave was you toss a six-sided die. <clears throat> the probability of any given face coming up is one out of six, because right? there's six possible outcomes. So if you're asking for the probability of a one or a two showing up, you add those probabilities together because they are mutually exclusive events. That is, they can't occur at the same time. You can't toss a die and have a one and a two come up. Okay, so you simply add the individual probabilities and it turns out it's two sixths or one third. Okay. So the product rule, the sum rule, we're going to use these a lot um, in doing some of these genetics problems. So let's look at some examples. All right, we have a simple cross, big A, little a, times little a, little a. Um, you've noticed the convention, I'm sure, by now, and I've mentioned it in class. Dominant alleles are uppercase, and recessive alleles are lowercase. So we know that this individual that's big A, little a, would show the dominant phenotype, whatever it happens to be. And the little a, little a would show the recessive phenotype, whatever that happens to be. Okay. What is the probability that the given offspring will show a dominant phenotype? Okay. If you were unsure about this answer, immediately you could do a little Punnett square to find out, just like the Punnett square as I did at the beginning of class. Um, the idea here is that the individual has to inherit a big A allele to show the dominant phenotype. All right, so if you do the Punnett square for that, you'll find that there's two of four possible ways for the in individual to inherit a big A. Okay, you have um, the big A, little a individuals producing big A gametes and little a gametes, and the little a individual just produces little a gametes. So you have in your Punnett square two squares or two uh, cells in the, in the Punnett square that have big A, little a in them and two cells that have little a, little a in them. Okay, so each of those probabilities has a probability of one-fourth. So we apply the OR rule, and the answer to the question would be one-half. We can say the individual can either get a uh, big A and a, the, little, the first little A from the other parent, or it can get a big A and the second little A from the other parent. There's two different possibilities, so we apply the OR rule. Okay, another example. Say we cross big A, little a, big B, little b, with big A, little a, big B, big B. Okay. What's the probability of getting that particular outcome? Okay, now, you've got, probably got the answer in front of you if you printed out the slideshows. But um, if you don't, um, to sort of think about it, remember that Mendel's rule of, of independent assortment allows us to deal with the A's separately from the bees. Okay, so imagine in your mind that cross, ignore the bees, just imagine in your mind the cross of big A little a with big A little a. You've seen that before. That's a classic monohybrid cross where you take two heterozygotes, you cross them together, and you get a three to one phenotypic ratio in the next generation. Okay, or one to two to one genotypic ratio. Okay, so let's do that on a overhead. I'll show you explicitly how to work that. We have uh, big A, what is it, big A, little a? Somebody tell me what it is. 
big A, little a, big B, little b. Okay, so big A, little a, big B, little b crossed with big A, little a, big B, big B. Good, okay. And we're asking for the probability of what offspring? It's a big A, big A, big B, little b. Okay. There we go. All right, so that's what we're asking for. Ignore the Bs, okay? Mendel's rule says we can do that. Ask only, first, what is the probability of getting a big A, big A from this cross? Big A, little a, with big A, little a. Okay. If you do, yeah, I'm already hearing the answer. That's good. Um, if you do this cross and you figure out what kinds of uh, offspring can result, right? It's a classic monohybrid cross. So each of these parents produces big A gametes and little a gametes in equal frequencies. We've got big A, big A here. So there's our big A, big A individual. Big A, little a's, and little a, little a's. So we find that this probability is one fourth. All right, now ignore the A's, do the B's. We're asking for the probability of a big B, little b. Well, we've got one individual that can produce two different kinds of gametes. This other individual only produces big B gametes. So the result is that. And we find that the probability of a big B, little b from this cross is 1 half. Okay. But we're not done because we're asking for this probability of having both of these events occur simultaneously. Big A, big A, and big B, little b. So we apply the and rule. All right, so the probability of a big A, big A, big B, little b is one-fourth times one-half, which equals one-eighth. That's the probability of getting that kind of individual from that cross. Right, so it's a direct application of the AND rule. <laughs> hey, everybody see how that works? Okay, so what did we do? Well, we saw that independent assortment said we could treat each pair of alleles separately. So we did that. We separated them out. We said the probability of a big A, big A, classic monohybrid cross is one fourth, just by doing a Punnett square. Probability of big B, little b is one half. Again, we did a Punnett square. We found that answer. Um, you'll get to the point, I think, where you'll be able to simply look at these crosses and say, okay, I know what the probability of each of these events is. But until then, you might want to work out Punnett squares just so you get fluent with it. It'll make it easier on exams. All right, so the probability of big A, big A, big B, little b, we apply the AND rule, multiply the individual probabilities, and we found that it was 1 eighth. All right, next example. Um, in many cases, we'll represent an allele with a blank. Right? That means that the, uh, the allele that's <coughs> present in that slot, in a sense, um, doesn't matter as far as the phenotype is concerned for the organism. Okay, so a big A blank, you could have big A, big A, or big A, little a, doesn't matter. Um, the phenotype is still going to be the same if it's a strict dominant recessive relationship. All right, so if we have this cross, big A, little a, big B, little b, cross with big A, little a, big B, little b. What's the probability of big A blank, big B blank offspring? Here you're going to have to apply both rules, the or rule as well as the and rule. Okay. How does that work? Oh, good, thank you. Okay. 
we have big A, little a, big B, little b crossed with big A, little a, big B, little b. We ask, what is the probability of getting big A blank, big B blank? Okay. Well, first thing you want to do is figure out what that blank implies in terms of the probabilities. Big A blank means we can have big A, big A, or big A, little a. Same thing with big B blank. It could be big B, big B, or big B, little b. All right. That or in there means we're going to have to apply the or rule at some point. All right. Well, again, let's apply Mendel's independent assortment rule and say we can ignore the Bs. We'll just get those out. And when you ignore those Bs, you find that this big A, little a with big A, little a is another classic monohybrid cross. So we have, in a sense, big A, little a crossed with big A, little a, which gives us the classic monohybrid cross outcome, which is big A, big A, big A, little a, big A, little a, little a, little a. All right, the probability, so what we're looking for is big A, big A, or big A, little a. The probability of uh, big A, big A is one fourth. The probability of a big A, little a is one half. So the probability of a big A blank equals one fourth plus one half, or three fourths. All right, now you're looking at this and you're saying, well, stupid, that's obvious. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's fine. You can call me stupid any time. Um, what's happening here is I want you to see how we're applying that rule, that or rule. We're saying we want a big A, big A, or um, this big A, little a, or this big A, little a. And so we have to add those probabilities. That's really what you're intuitively doing when you're doing this kind of cross. In reality, what you did is you looked at that and you said, OK, three out of four possibilities have a big A. So that's my answer. All right. You just did an end run around the or rule. <laughs> okay. But that's, this is the kind of thought process you should be going through. For the, the uh, B's now, we know that um, this big B, little b cross the big B, little b, again, is another classic monohybrid cross. So again, we're going to expect uh, one fourth big A, big A's, one half, whoops, we're looking at B's now. One half big B, big B, one half big B, little b, one fourth little b, little b in that cross. And so again, you're asking for big B, big B, or big B, little b. So the probability of getting one of those, big B blanks, where the second allele doesn't matter, you add up all the possibilities. It's one fourth plus one half. So again, it becomes three fourths. So the probability of a big A blank, big B blank, now we have two events occurring simultaneously. We're asking for big A blank and big B blank. Okay, Big A blank and big B blank. So we have to multiply the probabilities. Okay. So big A blank and big B blank. So we multiply. 3 fourths times 3 fourths equals 9 sixteenths. Which, if you're astute, you'll remember that that's exactly what Mendel found in his dihybrid crosses. In fact, this is the same kind of thought process that Mendel probably went through when he was trying to figure out how dihybrid crosses were working. He, he said, OK, if they assort independently, then they ought to behave as little monohybrid crosses. And lo and behold, they did. Okay. So that's exactly the kind of thought process that would, that would lead to the conclusions that he made. Okay, any questions on that one? <coughs> okay. <coughs> you can do higher levels of crosses as well. So let's sort of summarize what we did in this problem. Okay, so there's um, the cross that we did. We found the probabilities of big A, big A, or big A, little a, the probabilities of big B, big B, or big B, little b. And then in the offspring, we knew we had to have both of those happening at the same time. So we multiply those probabilities using the AND rule, and we find that the probability of a big A blank, big B blank, is 9 sixteenths. Right, so that's what we did. 
You can work backwards as well. Okay? You can look at offspring to determine parental genotypes. I already gave you a problem that did exactly that. You asked, what are the ratios of the offspring, and what does that tell me about the alleles that were present in the parents? Okay? Those ratios in the offspring are critically important because they will tell you whether an individual is homozygous or heterozygous. Um, the phenotypes will tell you that as well. If you're looking at a recessive phenotype, then you know um, the, the genotype of the individual. The simplest example of doing this is a test cross, where you try to determine the genotype of an individual that shows the dominant phenotype. With such an individual, you don't know necessarily whether they're, say, big A, big A versus big A, little a. You may not be able to know. But if you cross them in a controlled way and examine the offspring, then you will know what genotype they are. All right, so that's what we do. Here's an example. We cross a purple pea plant, purple flowered pea plant, to a white flowered pea plant, and we find that all the offspring have purple flowers. Was the purple parent homozygous or heterozygous? Intuitively, you ought to be able to answer this question. The reason is because you have a purple plant, a white plant, all the offspring have purple flowers, which is a dominant trait. Right? You don't see segregation of the white trait. It's masked. It's hidden. And that means that, in fact, that purple plant must be homozygous dominant. Right? In fact, there is the example. If this is big P, big P crossed with little p, little p, then all the offspring are heterozygous. But purple is dominant, so they all show the purple phenotype. Whereas, if the parent had been heterozygous, big P, little p, then this is the cross, big P, little p, with little p, little p. And the result of that is that half the offspring would be purple, the other half would be white. All right, so test crosses can be used to determine the genotype of an in individual who has the dominant phenotype, and we use them a lot. Um, they produce one-to-one -one ratios, unlike classic monohybrid and dihybrid crosses, which produce three-to-one ratios or nine-to-three-to-three-to-one ratios. You can even use these rules of probability to determine higher-level crosses. Okay. Um, Let's suppose that we have this cross. We have three things segregating. It should be no different than what you've done before. Right? Big A, little a, big B, little b, big C, little c. Big A, little a, little b, little b, big C, little c. Okay, well, let's work that out. So there is our cross. <clears throat> uh, Mendel's rule doesn't just apply to dihybrid crosses. It applies to higher level crosses as well. Um, so if we apply Mendel's rule to this, it means that we can treat each one of these independently. So we can say, well, big A, little a crossed with big A, little a. Hopefully you look at that and you immediately say, oh, OK, that produces 1 fourth big A, big A, 1 half big A, little a one-fourth little a, little a. So the probability of little a, little a is one-fourth. All right, you look at the second part, the b's, and you see that that's big b, little b, crossed with little b, little b. And hopefully by now you're saying, oh, that's a test cross. It produces one-to-one -one ratios. So I know that I'm going to have one-half big b, little b's, one-half little b, little b's. So the probability of little b, little b here is one-half. Then you look at the C's. And the C's, big C, little c, crossed with big C, little c. And again, you say, aha, that's a monohybrid cross. I have 1 fourth big C, big C, 1 half 
big C, little c, one fourth, little c, little c. So the probability of a little c, little c out of this is one fourth. Okay. You should be getting to the point, once you do a lot of these problems, you should get to the point where you simply look at a cross and say, aha, uh -huh, I know the offspring. All right. Monohybrid cross produces a one to two to one genotypic ratio. Test crosses produce one to one ratios. So that means that the probability of getting this kind of offspring out, we apply the and rule. We want little a, little a, and little b, little b, and little c, little c, all at the same time. So it's, uh, what, 4 times 4 times 4 is 16 times 2 is, what, 32? 1 out of 32? Is that right? See, I ask because I don't have to trust myself to add 2 plus 2 without a calculator. And even then, sometimes it comes out to be 5. So I don't trust my math. All right, so 1 32nd. Everybody see how that works? Cool. See, the reason I'm drilling you on this is that probably about 50 to 60 percent of the final exam is going to be problems that you're going to have to answer questions on. All right? So I want to make sure that everybody has a real good handle on these problems so that when you see something like this on the exam, you say, OK, finally I can answer one of Reinhardt's questions right <laughs> and do it. <coughs> All right, so <clears throat> we used independent assortment and worked each pair of alleles independently. Probability of little a, little a, we found to be one fourth. Little b, little b, one half. Little c, little c, one fourth. And we multiply those probabilities together to find the final probability, which is one thirty second for that kind of progeny from that kind of cross. Right, here's the answer. OK, any questions on that type of problem before I go on? Good. Excellent. OK. Pedigrees. Um, you've often seen pedigree diagrams probably if you do uh, dog or cat breeding or horse breeding. Um, any kind of animal or plant breeding, you tend to see these kinds of pedigrees. We use them a lot in human genetics to illustrate how particular traits are being transmitted through particular families. But you use them in animal science as well, when, or, or veterinary science, when you're trying to figure out um, particular, how particular traits are being transmitted in uh, particular animal species. All right, so human geneticists use these a lot because they help us to see um, how particular traits are being inherited. We can see if they're dominant or recessive. Um, we can see whether males or females are more prone to have the trait. We'll talk about um, sex linkage down the road, but it turns out that some traits affect males more often than females, and some other traits affect females more often than males. Part of that is due simply to um, the chromosomal differences between males and females. All right, so here's an example of a pedigree that your book shows. Um, we have a particular trait being transmitted through this uh, family, hereditary deafness. Turns out there are a lot of different causes of hereditary deafness. There are many different syndromes that re will result in deafness. Um, there are many different causes to those um, deafness syndromes. So when you say hereditary deafness, you really aren't talking about one particular um, syndrome. You're talking about a whole group of diseases or traits. Okay. So here we have individual, an individual who is uh, deaf, who was derived from two individuals who, were, who had hearing. And so these individuals must have been heterozygous if this is a recessive trait. <clears throat> it probably is. Because if it was dominant, then one of these individuals would have shown it, and they didn't. Right? So this is a recessive trait. It turns out that this individual is also uh, heterozygous for that recessive trait. So when these two individuals produce offspring, you'd expect that on average, half of them would be hearing, uh, be able to hear, and half of them would be deaf. Um, they beat the odds a little bit down here. But we do know that these two individuals who are deaf are definitely um, homozygous recessive. 
Okay? We also know that every other one of these individuals must be carrying that trait. Okay? The reason is because that's the only thing they can inherit. If they got a big D from their mother, they must have got a little D from their father. Um, these two individuals, we have no idea what their genotype is. We know it's a big D, but this is one of those big D blank situations because we have no idea what that second allele could have been. This individual could have been big D, big D, and this one big D, little d, could have been the other way around. Okay. Um, this individual could have arisen from a mutated gamete sex cell from either parent, and maybe the parents are both big D, big D. That's a possibility too. Okay. Um, that's how hemophilia arose in the royal family in England. Um, Victoria, there was a uh, mutation in a gamete that gave rise to Queen Victoria, and she was a carrier for hemophilia. All right, so the point of this is that we can use these pedigrees to determine the um, dominant recessive relationships as well as whether one sex or gender is affected more often than others. Okay, um, having established the rules of Mendelian inheritance, we're now ready to break them. Um, well, not really break them, but modify them to some extent. It turns out that when people first rediscovered Mendel's rules around the turn of the uh, 20th century, um, so the late 1800s, early 1900s, they found that for the most part, the Mendelian rules fit. They applied to many different organisms. Sometimes they didn't, though. Sometimes there were modifications of the Men basic Mendelian laws. And so those were written up and are generally presented as various modifications to Mendelian genetics. Right? So we'll look at three um, particular examples that your book covers. There are many other examples of modifications of Mendelian genetics that we can look at down the road if we have time. All right, the first one is incomplete dominance. It's not always the case that a particular allele is completely dominant over another allele. They may exert, in a sense, an equal effect, or one may be incompletely dominant over the other. So the other one seems to show through. Right, so the result of that is that you get a blended phenotype, um, crossing a plant with uh, yellow flowers and a plant with blue flowers and getting a plant with green flowers. Okay. That would be an example of uh, incomplete dominance. You have an intermediate effect, a blended effect. Uh, multiple alleles. Up to this point, we've looked at genes that only have two alleles, either a big, a big A or a little a. That's actually very rare. Most of the time, genes can have many different alleles in a population, right? hundreds or even thousands of different alleles in a population. Okay, and those can have very complicated dominant recessive relationships to each other. Some may be dominant, some may be incompletely dominant, some may be recessive to others and dominant to yet others. Right, so lots of complicated relationships there. We'll look at an example of that. Uh, pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is a situation that's typical for um, genetic traits, is that they affect many different organ systems or um, uh, biological processes in the individual. Um, sickle cell anemia is a nice example. Sickle cell anemia is, is homozygous recessive. It causes the, the blood cells, instead of being this nice sort of oval donut sort of shape, um, they end up being a sickle shape. What they do is they get clogged in small blood vessels, um, they damage blood vessels, they, they don't transport oxygen as well. The spleen has to break them down more frequently, so these individuals have severe anemia. They often have problems obtaining enough oxygen, which causes um, cardiovascular problems, heart and lung problems, circulatory problems, um, and it's really painful. It's, it's not a pretty disease. But that's an example of a pleiotropic effect. One simple change in a gene causes a whole spectrum of different effects in the individual who's unfortunate enough to inherit that particular trait. And so let's look at some other examples. Here's the example that your book gives of incomplete dominance. It's sort of the classic example. Um, we have snapdragons. We have a red snapdragon and a white snapdragon. We cross those together. And in the next generation, everybody's pink. 
right? If you see something like that, if in the, the following generation you see an intermediate phenotype, right, that's a, almost a dead giveaway that you've got incomplete dominance. The real trick here is when you bring this cross down to the F2. So you cross all the F1s to each other, you, you get an F2, and you get a 1 to 2 to 1 phenotypic ratio this time. Okay, you remember that monohybrid crosses give you uh, 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratios, but because you have complete dominance, you get a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. Here you don't have complete dominance, so you can tell what each individual's genotype is. So the red ones are big R, big R in this F2, and there's, a, there's one fourth of them are, are red. Half of the individuals are big R, little r, and they end up being intermediate, they're pink. And then one fourth of them are little r, little r, and they're white. Okay. So what happens then with an incomplete dominant situation is two things. You see an intermediate phenotype, and you see a one to two to one ratio in the next generation. Okay, so the phenotypic ratio is the same as the genotypic ratio. That's how you spot these things. Intermediate phenotype, one to two to one ratios in the phenotypic ratio. Okay. Uh, multiple alleles. The ABO blood group is sort of a good example of multiple alleles. Um, what happens with the the ABO blood group is that the A and B alleles specify a carbohydrate on the surface of blood cells. And the A type is different than the B type, which means that if you carry the A type, okay, so you just have A alleles or you have your, your uh, 1A and 1O allele, then that means that you have that A um, carbohydrate on your blood cells. So you won't make antibodies to it but you'll make antibodies to the other one, the B type. The Bs are the opposite. They have the B type of carbohydrate on their cell surfaces, so they don't make B antibodies, but they do make antibodies to the A type, which is why if you take uh, in blood from an A individual and mix it with blood from a B individual, it, it coagulates. All the blood cells start sticking together because those antibodies are binding to those carbohydrates on the surface. All right. That's not a good situation because you get these big clumps of blood cells and they clog vessels. <clears throat> if you're AB, though, AB is what we call co-dominant. Both alleles are expressed equally. And the result of that is that these individuals have on their blood cell surfaces both the A carbohydrate and the B carbohydrate, so they don't produce antibodies to either one. Right? So you can safely take cells from, say, an A individual, give them to an AB individual, as long as the cells are washed, so you've washed out those, those antibodies in their plasma, it's no problem. Right? O individuals have a recessive allele. That's why it's shown as little i, little i. It's a recessive allele. Those individuals do not have either of the um, carbohydrates on their blood cell surfaces. So they make antibodies to both of these um, carbohydrates. Right, so they have A antibodies and B antibodies in their blood. So not only do we have multiple alleles here, but we also have a co-dominant effect where the A and B alleles are equally expressed. O, however, is completely recessive. There are a number of traits in many organisms, humans included, that um, are determined by many genes acting together. In fact, most human traits are what we would call polygenic <laughs> traits. Okay, so polygenic is many gene inheritance, where a single trait is controlled by many genes. Eye color in humans, skin color, hair color, height, um, weight, is, is um, polygenic. And these traits are strongly, usually strongly influenced by environment. Height and weight certainly are influenced by environment. Um, to a lesser extent, things like hair color, skin color, eye color are influenced by the environment. All right, so here's an example of um, polygenic inheritance as it relates to skin color. 
It turns out there's at least four different genes contributing to skin color in humans, and there's probably actually more than that. But what we've done to simplify this figure is to show you that there's perhaps three genes, so we're only looking at three of them. We have a very light individual and a very dark individual. The very light individual has all of the recessive alleles, and the dark individual has all of the dominant alleles. But as you're going to see, dominant and recessive really don't mean much in this situation. Okay, there's not really a dominant recessive relationship. In the F1 generation, everybody gets uh, one of each of the dominant alleles and one each of the recessive alleles, so they're all intermediate in their phenotype. Okay, when those intermediate individuals reproduce, then you're looking at three traits segregating independently. The Punnett square that's produced is pretty ugly. There's 64 entries, okay, eight different gametes that each of these things can produce. However, the way this works is that if you inherit a, a big A or a big B or a big C, it has the same effect. So if you have one big A, it's the, it's the same effect as if you had one big B or one big C. We call these additive alleles. Each allele adds an equal amount to the phenotype. So a big A, for example, adds a certain amount to, a pheno to the phenotype, and it's the same amount that a big B or a big C would add. So if we look at the combinations that we get out of this Punnett square, we see that up at the very, very top, we have one lone individual, or 1 64th of the total individuals, that are very light-skinned, 1 64th that are very dark-skinned, and everybody else is intermediate in between those two, depending on how many alleles um, dominant alleles they're carrying. Right? That's an additive effect, and that kind of effect contributes to many, if not most, human traits, and traits in many other organisms as well. <clears throat> okay, that's a good place to stop. So we'll stop there and continue on this. On